Good morning, folks, and welcome to another Como Live brought to you by the Legacy Amendment. Today, we're going to talk about leafcutter ants. Uh, a few months ago, we talked about them in depth uh, as far as what they are, how they behave, and uh, a little bit kind of a fun fact deep dive. But today we're going to talk more about the care that goes into um, what I do as far as taking care of them, but also the care that we take in making sure that um, they are well contained and that we keep them from getting um, into places where they should not be. And we'll talk a lot more in depth about that in a moment. Um, but we'll, we'll start off with just kind of typical care. So. Ants in general do a lot to take care of themselves. They are very instinctual about how they operate. You can go back to that older video to get more detail on, on, on what they do. But uh, in general, the care that I uh, initiate with them is making sure that they have food, making sure that it's not too hot, cold, or humid, and correcting those um, imbalances if they happen. So feeding is quite easy. Uh, today they got some romaine lettuce, but normally they'd get some sort of brambly uh, type thing. We do a lot of blackberry bramble here um, at the zoo. Um, they also will eat pretty much anything that's kind of a, a bramble or vine type of leaf um, as those tend to be a little bit more tender and they can really, really get into them and eat them pretty well. Uh, but today they've got romaine and I do try to mix it up throughout the week. Sometimes I'll give them dandelion, sometimes uh, blackberry bramble. We've even done some raspberry and strawberry uh, leaves before as well. Um, so they get a, a wide array of different leafy materials. The great thing about romaine is that romaine has a lot of water in it. So I like to at least give them that once a week. Um, that makes sure that they're well hydrated and that the area stays uh, a little bit humid in there, um, but not overly so. The other thing that I do when it comes to care is making sure that the temperature is okay. Um, if the temperature is too low, they start to really slow down their metabolism. If it gets really low, um, you will start seeing die off. Uh, we've not had a temperature uh, fluctuation that low that that's happened, which is great. Um, and the other thing is the temperature being too high. Uh, this is something that would basically send their bodies into overdrive metabolically. They wouldn't be able to keep up and they would die just like a mammal would with heat exhaustion. Um, it would have to get pretty warm for that to happen to an ant. You're talking about approaching, uh, you know, 100 plus degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in this room, we stay usually between 70 and 85. Um, so they're really not going to have an issue with temperature um, so long as all of our systems work. And if they don't, you know, it's an easy call to get maintenance to come and look at those sort of things. Uh, so that's really the basic care that I do. Um, if things are too wet or too dry, obviously the wetness I can deal with by um, kind of getting in there and sucking out any excess moisture. Um, but that brings us to the, the larger issue at hand, and that's containment. Um, a lot of the insects we have here at Como are uh, what we call uh, potential pest animals, and they're all regulated by the USDA. Um, what that means is that if these animals were to get out and potentially find a way to survive here in, in North America, they could become huge pests as far as agriculture goes. Um, Leafcutter ants, as you can imagine, could just decimate entire areas of cropland should they get out and should they find that. Um, the other problem that they're looking for is disease. We do have a lot of beneficial insects as well in the United States that we don't want outside insects bringing uh, parasites and other diseases uh, into the country because you know we don't want to lose our bees and our butterflies uh, and our beetles that are so beneficial for pollination. Um, and so we have very, very strict protocols as to how we contain a lot of these potential pest animals. Um, so these guys here, they are essentially locked in. We have it so that everything is sealed up. I have two points of access to their internal exhibit, both of which are latched down tight. They have a seal in between the, the lid and the tank. And then we also have locks on everything to make sure that um, they're tamper proof as well. 
And this is all things that USDA wants to see. Um, it's things that we like to show them when they're here. Uh, whenever we design an, an exhibit for public viewing, uh, we actually have to have that dialogue with USDA and meet a lot of their standards and they have to okay things. Uh, if we come up with a, a new idea for containment, we have to run that by them as well. Um, so there is a very strong collaboration uh, between zoos and the USDA as far as making sure these things are contained well. Now this is also for the benefit of these animals. They're very small. If they were to get out, um, you know, we don't know where they'd end up. And the part of that problem is that there are other animals, even in this room, that would potentially try to eat them. The birds, for example. Um, there are also some, some frogs and lizards in here that are, are running around. Um, and so we want to make sure that our animals are kept safe and that we're keeping the environment safe from our animals. So there's a lot of containment protocol that goes into that. Uh, now this particular species, they are tropical. They would probably not survive uh, a winter in Minnesota. So they're not a very high profile um, containment animal. But if you think about it this way, adaptation in nature doesn't always happen on our terms. It could very well happen that this species of ant gets out, they find some way to burrow deeper into the soil and survive a winter, and then you've got a real problem. So that's why we like to keep these animals uh, really under lock and key. Now, in addition um, to just keeping the animals themselves contained, we also have to do a lot as far as waste management goes. Um, and that goes back to making sure that there's no potential eggs, that there's no potential um, disease vectors in their waste, uh, no potential toxins um, in their waste that get outside of the system we've created. Uh, so every bit of waste that we would pull out of, not just this exhibit, but any of our um, USDA regulated exhibits, um, that stuff all gets double bagged immediately and thrown into a freezer. Um, unless you have an autoclave on hand, then you can autoclave it um, to the standards which the USDA requires you to autoclave. An autoclave basically means that you are heating it under pressure, making sure that nothing that's organic or living in there can survive that process. Um, and that is all to make sure that these things do not accidentally affect the native Minnesota environment. Um, so you'll actually see by looking in there, on one side we've kind of got food, the other side we got a big waste pile going. Um, eventually I will clean that waste pile out and that is all done um, by scooping and vacuuming it, putting it into a double bag system and taking it immediately to our freezer um, and that freezer process, it has to be negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit or colder uh, to meet that USDA threshold uh, to make sure nothing survives. Um, that'll stay in the freezer for at least three days. Once it's been in there for three days, we consider it free of any sort of organic contamination and it's good to be then thrown out into normal, normal waste. Um, so as far as the daily care goes, a lot of insects, they do a great job of taking care of themselves. If you give them food, you give them water, they will know how to find it. Um, cleaning is pretty minimal because they will pretty much eat everything you give to them um, and you just clean out the waste occasionally as needed. Um, but it is very tricky to make sure you get your humidity and temperatures right and to make sure you're following protocols to make sure that they are, are kept uh, relatively quarantined, if you will. Now. Let's go back to that temperature humidity thing. We're very lucky that we have this, this tropical encounters room that stays warm and humid pretty much all year round. If that were not the case, this species would be very, very hard to exhibit. You would have to have special systems built in to provide extra humidity, special heating elements put into the exhibit design to make sure that it stays at the proper temperature. And this is something that we have to do with a lot of our other insects here at the zoo uh, that are not up here in TE. Um, ideally, the rooms are going to be climate controlled, so they'll stay at a certain temperature, at a certain humidity. Um, but then sometimes you'll get an animal that's a desert species or maybe one that is a tropical species. Um, so the desert one, you might need to put a heat lamp on there to increase the temperature, uh, but also dry the exhibit out. Uh, with your tropical ones, you might need to add a little extra humidity and uh, ultimately 
uh, that is going to be a balancing act that you are always going to be looking at every day when you come into work to make sure that those systems are working well. Luckily for me, because we're in this room and because uh, uh, the curator here at the zoo designed this exhibit uh, in a way that maintains humidity, maintains temperature, and is built pretty much rock solid as far as containing, containing these animals goes, um, the amount of care I have to do is minimized, which is fantastic because it means when I do the daily care, there's a few things I got to look at and then I can observe behavior longer and not have to kind of uh, uh, twiddle my thumbs doing all these other tweaks and adjustments. It's just making sure things are okay and then really looking at the animal's behavior to see if they're doing well. Um, all of these things play in with pretty much any insect, uh, any invertebrate you're ever going to be taking care of. Uh, whether that's, you know, scorpions, beetles, millipedes, uh, you know, tarantulas, all these animals have very specific things that they need. And if you're not meeting those needs, uh, you'll start to notice it in the behavior. And if you don't correct it soon enough, uh, you will get animals that die from that. They are very sensitive to their environment. Uh, so that being said, care can be really easy if you set everything up well the first time around, um, but it can also be very finicky if you're not paying attention to your environmental thresholds. Now with these guys here, the other thing I'm going to be looking at is are they producing fungus? If they're not producing fungus, I know something's wrong with the colony. Typically that's my cue to look at temperature humidity, but it's also my cue to look at their lifespan. Uh, these animals at most are going to live about 15 years and then you'll start seeing them die off. Um, so it is uh, kind of on me to keep track of those things in my head. Um, because knowing whether this is a problem that needs to be fixed or whether this is just their time to go, it's very important. It also means that behind the scenes there's work that needs to be done to prepare for uh, the next colony that we decide to bring in for this space. Um, so a lot of little check, check marks to look at every single day. Uh, when you're when you're working with a species. Now, uh, there's not a whole lot more to say on care. I will say this: zoos across the country that have invertebrate collections, you know, your insects, they're all doing this. The amount of work that goes into this sort of uh, type of animal uh, is very extensive. So, if we were to get a colony from another zoo, for example, there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be done. Um, on our end, on their end, and between us and the USDA to make that happen. Um, we have to be certified by the USDA while we hold and exhibit these animals, uh, which means there's a lot of other paperwork that goes on behind the scenes, making sure that we're up to date on all their standards and that they're signed off on everything. Uh, so in addition to actually the care of the animals, there's also a care to make sure that we're doing it the right way. And that is all regulated by the USDA. Um, like I said earlier, it is a collaboration, a partnership we have with them. Uh, they understand our need to want to educate people about these animals. We also understand their need to have these animals contained. And so we work together to really make this, uh, this type of exhibit work. And so the amount of work that goes into just getting an exhibit like this ready to go um, can take months up to years even just to get the get go to say go ahead and do that. Um, and then throughout that process, there's even more collaboration that goes on. Um, this is also something, if you've ever been to the zoo while we've had our um, seasonal butterfly exhibit, the butterfly stuff, also extremely extensive with USDA stuff. Uh, we really want to make sure those non-native species stay in there and don't disrupt our, our local ecology here in Minnesota. Uh, 